Joining us now, of course, she's the head coach of the Washington Huskies. And in 2022 is, of course, the U.S. national head coach. She's been a part of USA softball for a while now. Part of an incredible 2022 year that I easily could say was the busiest coach in softball in 2022. And that's Heather Tart joining us here. I think that's a fair. You earned that, that, that line right there. You were the busiest coach in 2022. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Sometimes I uh, wonder, you know, like you have so limited time to just do maybe not softball related stuff. But, you know, those of us that are crazy enough to really like get into this thing at the USA level, you start thinking like, wow, I guess this can be my vacation, but you don't really ever get a, get a time off. But I mean, I, I wouldn't want it any other way. Well, I remember we spoke when you got the job and we looked ahead what was coming and you knew that this was going to be the balancing act. Obviously, Coach Washington will get into that season and, and the outlook this year, but obviously with the U.S. national team in 2022, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you were in Canada for the Canada Cup, Birmingham for the World Games, in Japan for the All-Star Series, and I believe you were in Guatemala, I want to say, as well in the fall. Like, Am I missing something there or anything incorrect there? No, you got it. You must be looking at my uh, online scrapbook or something. Those were all the places. We coached four different teams this year with four different coaching staffs. And it was a challenge, a uh, really fun challenge and uh, just a wonderful experience overall. What What did you learn from it? What did you learn from it? Because you uh, going through that, uh, you mentioned four different staffs, tremendous success. You win the goal, you know, you win the world games, which is huge. We'll get into that. But what did you learn about yourself and about being part, you know, now that you've gone through it for a year? Yeah, that's a good question because I think, you know, if you're not learning, if you're not getting better, why would you even do this stuff? Because, you know, it's a, it's a lot of commitment, but I think I learned a lot about myself as a coach. And one of the things I really took away was the you just really just have to be efficient, especially in these environments where, you know, they say um, nothing should be so complex that you can't explain it to like a four-year-old. And so really, really getting like communication dialed in, being concise, knowing with the coaching staffs primarily, all right, what are our objectives? What are the things we're really focusing on? What are the things that we really need to get in here in this one day practice that we actually have before the competition Um, I'm being facetious there but some of them really were like one day of practice Um, and then you know really relying on the athletes and how lucky are we to have the athletes that are used to being in those show and go type of environments but I really just learned communication what's important um, how to you know create a system in a matter of moments and then really rely on your people to execute it and it sounds kind of a weird thing to bring up but You have to love travel. Like, I know you've liked traveling, but you, I mean, part of the job is traveling. Uh, Do you still enjoy traveling? It's kind of a sarcastic joke after all the travel you've done, because obviously your time at Washington, you travel a lot as it is during a college season, but now you're traveling globally. Mm -hmm. How big of a factor is that is you have to embrace the travel and being accustomed to it almost. Yeah, you definitely do have to be uh, okay getting, you know, getting on planes and going places. I think I've really learned that, I don't like travel unless I can be somewhere. If I'm on like a four plus hour flight, I don't like to just be somewhere for two days. If I'm there for 14 days or a matter of time, I don't mind it. But when it's those quick, like get across the country or go really far in a short amount of time, I I have a a really hard time with that now. But um, yeah, I definitely, you know, we, we got to experience a lot. I've been able to experience a lot from going to countries that, you know, are completely different from the United States. Um, like Guatemala or the Dominican Republic uh, to then being able to, you know, experience Japan and and how they value softball and that sport there. It's, it's a very rewarding experience to go to all those places. You mentioned the four different coaching staffs, four different type of teams, different players, mixing in different players. How do you feel about the overall depth and talent of team USA? It's always cliche. We got so much talent, but you got to see it, got to coach it up so, uh, with different styles and players. What'd you learn about the, what we have in, in team U as far as us national team players? Well, looking at the the pool of players that we were able to draw from, I'm really proud of USA softball for embracing that idea of having more op- options um, of the athletes, um, whether it be a more um, collegiate based team to a more athletes unlimited pro league team. Uh, it's it's pretty neat to see the, these players in this country, how well prepared they are through the college system, um, how 
great they are leading up to the college system and how we how we just grow softball here is is fantastic and you know it leaves you wanting more as a coach of these women whether it be looking at them like a Haley McClenney, you know, how long can she continue to play this game with limited funding, with limited, you know, support from that end. And you just want more for them. So having more players probably doesn't help you provide more for, you know, 15 women that might just be considered the national team. But I just think having the opportunity to have so many, so many players be able to wear the USA Jersey, um, and really wear it with integrity. It, it makes me proud of our country for being able to, um, you know, just have the access to those types of athletes. You've got to work with different coaches. Uh, two I will bring up. One in the, let's start with the Canada Cup one, because you had Coach Cozy, Coach Ball Malone, and Jim, uh, Coach Kalaitis on that staff. We had Coach Cozy on here. He said that was one of his favorite things of his entire softball career was to be part of that staff and back reunited, if you will, with you and Coach Ball Malone. For those that don't know, obviously you go way back to the Pacific days for Coach Cozy. What was that like for you to be reunited, kind of that Pacific reunion in, in that during the Canada Cup? Well, being able to have, you know, and encourage other coaches to be involved in USA softball is something that um, I'd like to do more of and, you know, get more coaches involved in that, in the coaching pool um, per se. But being able to have Coach Colsey be a part of the pool, you know, he's been in part of the pool for, our, um, you know, other quads and, you know, more so during like the 04 to the 08 type of Olympic stuff. And I actually don't remember this much, but I, I listened to the episode and it reminded me of when I was coaching with him, he would go on USA Adventures. And I, I remember even at the time being an assistant to him, I didn't really think that much of it. You know, I wasn't, I, I don't know. And so now when I'm being the head coach of this whole thing, I wonder what our assistant coaches think. And it, it brought me a little bit back to that, but um, it was very rewarding to be able to include him on the staff at the Canada cup and um, you know, have Cindy ball, Brian Colsey and I all on one staff again, of course, Jimmy Colitis was awesome. Um, and then the players were just uh, the athletes were amazing. So it was a very cool experience to, kind of full circle that one yeah he said he just kind of stayed quiet he listened this time around that's what he did that was what he did he said it was the smartest thing he did yeah i think it brought us cindy and i both back to you know like we felt like it was 2003 again um in a really cool way where she and i are probably you know more more mature more evolved in in the profession and and coach colsey he's just so consistent and he's just such a great guy so he was kind of who he normally was on a role of a coaching staff and um, Bear and I got to be be ourselves. It was it was neat to be able to do that twenty some years later. Hey, you mentioned the years I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but then you get the World Games, which was obviously the you know big all eyes on the World Games there in Birmingham. Uh, Coach Ball Malone was with you as well as Tim Walton and Tony Baldwin. You all reunite from when you were together on the under nineteen uh, Cold World Champions in twenty nineteen. What was it like to reunite with them and then beating Japan? Dramatic game. Uh, I, I will never forget Ali Carter's performance there to win that world games and win the championships. What was it like to, that experience? Yeah, a little bit of a redemption feel for those women that were with us in, um, you know, 2021 in Tokyo, not having fans, not, you know, really having a, a stage that, you know, made you feel like it was, you know, the, the best game that could have possibly ever been played in the world, um, which it was in Tokyo Olympics. But to be able to have the opportunity again and, and try to provide, um, you know, a base for these women to be able to be at their best when their best was needed, that was really fun um, to include Coach Walton, Tony Baldwin, Cindy Ball, um, just our entire staff, you know, um, Christian Conrad, KK Letty, um, they helped a lot out too. I mean, people in those types of roles, they can do a little bit more than maybe you can in the college game. So their roles were super important as well, but it was just neat to be able to play in front of the USA fans. Um, you know, I think it was maybe eight to 9,000 plus at that game um, to be able to have Janae Jefferson come through uh, when we really needed some runs to be scored. Um, and then just give those women an experience at the highest level to be able to draw on, um, you know, for years to come and then give the Ali Carters of the group, you know, I mean, she's not old, but some of those older players, that opportunity to walk away with a gold medal on their own home, you know, home soil was, was pretty rewarding. I've heard that that coaching staff in particular, you all get a little competitive in there. Uh, I've heard <laughs> even fungal golf. I've heard it gets really intense. Oh. 
Is that true? Yeah, it's when you've got now four head coaches in in the mix at the at the places that we coach. You know, we kind of vie for time and you know set ourselves up to share ideas and and humbly accept the you know like which idea is what it is. But it's just a great group to learn from. You know, probably each year we come back together. There's something new we've evolved in. Oh, we we've been doing this. Are we trying this? Let's add this. So it's really fun to be able to come together. Coach Walton is always trying to like, oh, we need to get these shoes. We need to get these clothes. And we're like, yeah, get them for us then. Use your Nike money to do it. But um, it's a, yeah, it's a really fun group when we have the time to get together. It's never enough time actually. Yeah, we need to get a, a documentary or reality show like next time you all together there. That that seems like made for TV or something. I don't yeah, know it could be one. It. Yeah, for but, sure. But you mentioned you work with a lot of different coaches because then you had a different staff as well while you're in Japan and Guatemala. What is that like? Do you all pick each other's brain? I've heard that, that one of the, the joys, and you mentioned why you want to get other coaches, but it's a great experience and the coaches leave that, that experience being better coaches. They learn some, you know, from each other. Yeah, I think there's, there's that part where, you know, it's kind of coming together of, you know, how people roll, you learn a lot, but also too, giving these women an opportunity to learn from these coaches. And, you know, it's kind of like, that's not really speed dating, but it's just quick. Um, you know, I mean, coaching is important, but at the end of the day, the athlete and how they feel and how they feel prepared is the most important thing. So yes, it's about us trying to learn and grow from each other, but you just try to create an environment that's not distracting to the athlete. That's not going to take away from them because you're really not getting too far into certain things you're you know encouraging them to do what they do execute their process more so than you are like coaching them I mean that is coaching if you really know coaching that's really the the beauty of coaching but it's been cool to see uh, you know different groups of of humans coming together and um, really trying to create an environment that the the other you know the athletes can perform in what's next for USA softball you mentioned funding that was something I know when we spoke when you you got hired you know a year ago you said that's at the top of your list to help improve that. What, what's next for Team USA moving forward? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of things that we can do better just in general. Um, you know, like there's there's opportunities, one, that we can create for, for the sport, whether it be, you know, more funding opportunities that we can create, the athletes can get supported year round financially. Um, there's some models out there with other countries that we envy, you know, the Canadian system's pretty, Pretty nice, um, completely different government system, completely different country. Of course, we look at Japan as well. Um, but then you look at the other countries, like, you know, some of the Latin countries don't have any funding. And so you're thinking in Australia, even though in Gabby's, Gabby Plains path, um, some of those athletes paying their own way to things. So you're kind of like, well, <laughs> you know, who, who has it worse or who has it better? But it just would be nice to edify these women's experience in the professional, you know, next level scene past college um, to have it be something where they can strive for, they can be supported in. So I don't necessarily have control of those things. Um, I'm not the, you know, director of funding, uh, Chris sure. Sieberin and Craig Kress, of course, they work their tails off for these women and these programs to be able to have these opportunities. But um, I'm always wanting more and wanting better uh, for our game, for our women. So I'm into to finding and continue to find those paths for those gals. Well, no, and this is the time when these topics and these things get brought up because, you know, down the road, people always talk about the Olympics, Olympics. Well, you don't get an Olympics if you don't take care of some of the things now. You can't wait till years from now, right? That's a big part of this. Yeah, I think there's a, after we played in Japan a couple months ago, um, you know, primarily a group of collegiate athletes. And I, at the end of it, we were, we went um, one and two in that experience, but every single game was such a close game. And I think those women specifically still having a platform um, and having, you know, people watch them. I thought it was important for them to, you know, at the time when we left Japan to speak about how valuable of an opportunity that could be for them in their future, um, possibly being a part of a 2028 Olympic team and being in LA um, but you're going to need a lot of coordinated, eff coordinated efforts. And I'm not like with the USOPC, I'm not on the level like that. I, you know, I don't know if I want to be, I don't know if I, I should be, but you just, there's a lot of things going on that go on that we as a sport don't necessarily have control over, but um, you know, you just hope that maybe uh, the LA games committee can help find a way for softball uh, and baseball to be included in the 2028 games. And we don't know the certainty of that. We don't know uh, for sure when that D-Day is, but 
uh, all we can do is positively contribute to the sport in the ways that we can. But, you know, certainly you want those hopes and those dreams to be something that people can aspire to, because that also levels up the game in a way that uh, we've, we've benefited from, but we hope to continue to benefit from. Well, you got a lot of hats as it is. I think we don't need to add more hats for you. We can, you know, we can find, we can spread the wealth on the hats. One of the hats you have, like you mentioned, obviously you coach Washington. I'm curious, you know, you, you were curious balancing act, balancing being the head coach at Washington, which is a big priority, obviously, and being the head coach of the U.S. National. You went through it last season. Washington, obviously, all wear a top 16 national seed there. What did you learn about that from the standpoint of being the head coach of Washington and balancing it? How, do you feel it went smoothly? Do you think there's some things you think, you know, you could have wished you could have tweaked? I mean, how do you, how would you describe that experience from the Washington end uh, of your standpoint? I think the hardest part is just physically when you have to be gone, when your team is in session. Now you can accommodate with a great coaching staff, um, Coach Glasso on our staff, his veteran, you know, veteran leadership in our program really helps me when I do have to leave because it's not like, you know, we're leaving without someone that really knows how it needs to go. So that gives me the peace of mind when I do have to leave. Like when we went to Guatemala in November, I had to leave some training and I didn't like that. It was really hard because we had built so much momentum in the fall. And then in my brain, I'm like, well, I need to build this next group, you know, in these next 15 days in Guatemala. So that was like a mental challenge, obviously, you know, there's harder problems in the world to solve, but that was a challenge. But, um, you know, overall, I think uh, USA has made it simple. Um, they pretty much do a lot of stuff for you as a head coach that you don't have to think about. Whereas here at Washington, if it were reciprocated in the other way, I don't think I could do it where you know, I really have to be present and be here for Washington. Whereas at USA, you can not take shortcuts. I'm not going there, but just, you know, Chris Sebrin and those, you know, the staff there really help help you manage that program. So you can definitely do both. But I think the recruiting side in the summers, um, you know, not me maybe being at some of the things I would have liked to have been at, um, you know, evaluating a little bit more. You know, you have your times, but it all works out somehow. Um, and I, like I say, it's because of the team of, of, you know, coaches we have here at Washington and the awesome support staff at USA Softball makes it pretty you know, easy to be, be done hard, but easy. You haven't figured. Yeah. We just got to clone you. That's all you got to clone it. That <laughs> yeah. would solve some of this, right? I know. Uh, I wish, I wish I could like warp <laughs> myself into right? places. That's yeah, the hardest that's, part. Yeah. That's, that's the easy thing. Let's talk about this year's team. Everybody, all the local media, when they talk to you and everything, they're going to ask you this question, which is obviously the pitching staff. It's strange. I think this might be the first time I've ever talked to you and talking about Gabby playing, but not being on the team anymore. It feels <laughs> weird. I, I, I had to double check the roster to make sure that was accurate. First, yeah. Let's talk about her legacy. She was nominated for woman of the year. Cause I think it'd be fair. Let's first talk about the impact she's had on the program. Yeah. It's a, she had an awesome legacy five years uh, worth of, of competing here with us. You know, you get used to it, but you know, as we know, as all, all co college coaches prepare themselves for and their programs for is, you know, graduation. That's what you, that's the destination. So I think for us, it's not as weird because we've, you know, built it up since last June to know we aren't going to have, you know, Gabby on our, on our coaching staff, but she just left such a tremendous legacy and she did it with such grace and, you know, she just did her job so consistently from the time we relied on her heavily her freshman year taking us to the national championship series um, to then, you know, in to the end of her career when she was not necessarily like an old horse, but because she's still young and she still could play this game forever. But for our program and in the college game, you know, you get seen, you get thought, thought out, you get approached, you get, you know, scouted out. So she, she just really succeeded so consistently um, from start to finish. And it's definitely something that we will miss, but, you know, like, like I said, as someone that gets to be a part of building what's next, um, you, 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 you got to move on from that real quick. And we're excited for these, you know, four women that we do have on our, on our uh, pitching staff, they get to see what they can do and how good they can get and how much they can develop with, you know, maybe not a Gabby playing on the staff. So tell us a little bit about the, the girls that will take over in the pitching staff. And then do you envision them as a committee? Do you see them maybe one or two establishing themselves as the season goes on? How do you envision this staff? Well, I think it's going to depend a little bit on, on how things go for us, but we'd like to say we have a committee. Um, 
we definitely, you know, don't have a said returning number one, you know, collegiate player of the year on our, on our pitching staff. But I, I think that said, it's an exciting time for our program um, and these women in it. Ruby Malin's a freshman from Omaha, Nebraska, who's going to come in right away and be able to take a, a, a brunt of the innings, um, but needs time to develop. Kelly Lynch, of course, she's in her uh, fourth year with us. And, you know, we just have high hopes for her and continue to do so. Um, she's got, got some, you know, just great experience under her belt. Brooke Nelson, another four-year player for us uh, from the state of Washington, who's just a super um, awesome competitor. And then we transferred in Lindsay Lopez from Arizona State, who's been used to being a part of a staff um, and playing all kinds of roles, starter, middle reliever, spot gal, um, but lefty lefty that brings us a little bit of a different dimension because we have three righties and one lefty so we're going to see how it goes we got a tough schedule but um they're going to be ready for it offensively you return obviously good talent especially bailey klingler who i think is arguably the best player in the sport there were times last year coach watching your team where she carried your team where mm -hmm. willed your team there offensively to wins uh, some come from behind wins and made your other players around her better just talk about that special talent that she has because I, I every time i watched her i just got more and more impressed yeah she's a kind of a silent assassin um you know i think a lot of people you know don't really think about her as much as maybe they could but uh she she was super consistent for us um you know a lot of times as the game got tougher she got better and that's a sign of a great husky those are the kind of players that we want to recruit we want to find to come to our program but she definitely makes other people around her better just in how she approaches the game she's such a tough out hard to strike out um, and somebody that we're so glad that we get to have back with this group because we really didn't lose anybody on offense this year. So everybody returns um, and just continuing to help, you know, everybody in our offense continue to thrive. You know, the challenge I think for most coaches in this era is that you do have a lot of those fifth year seniors that are in your lineup, which then you have some up and coming freshmen that, you know, they, they're like, so young compared to a Bailey Klingler or a silent Rain Espinoza, just, you know, as two examples. So I think that's the challenge is we have a lot of depth. We have a lot of opportunities, um, but then we have a lot of retention. Um, so we're going to continue to, you know, relish in our opportunities to have people like Bailey Klingler and Maddie Husky in our offense. But then again, we have some freshmen that we really want to see shine and um, some younger players too that, you know, just can need continued development. Of the new faces, who do you think you mentioned? Because you got a lot back. You know, I remember last year we spoke about you had all these young players and you didn't know you were talented, but you just don't know. And, you know, they went through the experience. Now they're experienced. But now you got some new faces you're adding to the ingredients. Do you? How many do you think can contribute on an everyday basis uh, to your offense and your defense, which obviously you take a lot of pride in? Yeah, I think there's, you know, the, there's a couple that um, we're going to need to rely on, but then again, we have that senior leadership, that veteranship that we can, you know, kind of let us let carry us. But I would just say almost like a Riley Holtorf is almost like, you know, still um, not a first year player, but she played she played here and there and a little bit everywhere last year. But, you know, just kind of using um, our defense as, you know, letting her have some. Uh, consistent time at shortstop but we also have a freshman named Alana Johnson from Summit Mississippi who has a lot of hope and um, we have a lot of promise in her so I'd like to see her get in there and get some time to develop but Kinsey Fiedler great athlete um, she played a lot of second base for us last last year um, but just want to see her continued growth Sydney Stewart a catcher from Northern California um, who's just gotten stronger and stronger as the year has gone on. So we're hopeful about just some things that, that she can show us. Um, but just overall, like it's kind of the same team with a couple different uh, additions, minus Gabby Plain. Um, uh, you know, no disrespect to Pat Moore, who was with us for, for, you know, four years, and she did awesome for us. But it's 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 really like a lot of the same team with, with a couple additions. Um, a lot of uh, sass uh on our on our freshman in our freshman group a lot of uh they come with a lot of uh personality and that's that's cool this team needs that um, because we are such like a, a unit that's been together for such a long time but these freshmen are going to be excited exciting to watch
And you've challenged their team on your schedule like you usually do. No different this year. You're going to open up in, at the Mark Campbell Invitational, which that's becoming a big, big tournament with all the, obviously, admiration and respect people have for Mark Campbell for what he's contributed to the game of softball. But you're going to open up in that tournament. you got Duke in that tournament, Liberty, San Jose State, and Oklahoma right off the bat. So you're going to learn a lot about your team. You're going to play Loyola Marymount, Coach Flowers led into the tournament. You're going to Houston for a tournament. Just talk about your tournament, uh, your scheduling philosophy non-conference. Well, our scheduling, um, you know, pretty much consistent. We tend to always show up in the Mary Nutter in Palm Springs. We like going to that tournament. And then around, um, you know, the week one or week two, we're trying to build our RPI. And like you're saying, we're going to see see what we're made of and see what we have to do to continue to get better for the Pac-12. But, um, yeah, being down there in Irvine, committing to, you know, coming to the Oklahoma tournament now down there mark campbell's uh memorial tournament it's great for us um we've had players in our program that have played for mark so that's going to be a neat experience for them we have a ton of california players so that's great um but just you know bring bring anyone anytime anywhere and we're going to try to see how good we can get against them um so our schedule is a challenge again for us and we welcome it we're excited about it and um we're ready to go into the fire with this group and then a Pac-12 that I think proved a lot of, you know, you know, proved a lot in the postseason last year with Oregon State making the World Series, UCLA World Series, Arizona World Series, uh, you know, Stanford going to the Super Regional. Because I remember we've talked to all the coaches. There was a chip on the shoulder from previous years. We don't need, you know, we, we've talked about in the past. Pac-12 show, made a loud statement, and I know a lot of coaches took pride in that within the as coaches within the league of the success you all had as a whole as a league in the tournament. Well, it's just so random, you know, like, um, having uh, both Arizona and, and Oregon State have the opportunity where maybe people weren't even like thinking about those teams, but you know, they made good on their opportunities of where they went and, you know, maybe had some upsets, but in our mind as Pac-12 coaches, like, uh, you know, so much um, parity at the top where like one through nine, it's not like a one through nine. It's just like nine teams that play softball really well and through it all through the, you know, the conference uh season you get so you learn so much about yourself so any it's fair game at the end of the season um and just geographically when 80 percent of the population lives um you know east of the mississippi it's it's going to continue to get harder and harder for us now that media is more involved in softball uh and and like people are more on tv and everything like that to get uh people to notice us because three hours behind East coast time. Sometimes you forget like, Oh shoot, there's a game on and it's whatever time it is for, for you guys on the East coast. Um, just the sport growing and getting more media attention is going to make it and continue to make it more of a challenge for, for the West coast teams. Um, just like in basketball, just like in football to be seen and um, make sure people don't forget who we are when they go to bed at night. Well, and with that in mind, the PAC 12 this year is going to the PAC 12 conference tournament for the first time. Uh, format what's your reaction to having the conference tournament i know part of it is to get more exposure as most conference tournaments do at that that weekend uh some of it is to help get more teams into the league i know uh, talking to coaches they you all feel that you can get everybody in the league to the tournament uh i mean utah was literally a game away maybe from making the tournament they were the last team out um so talk about the pac-12 tournament your thoughts on that and the adjustments that you may have to make now is you know preparing for a conference tournament yeah, it's a different thing for us. Um, you know, it's good. We have a transfer um, from Oklahoma State. Her name's Avery Hobson, and she's the only person in our program that can say she's experienced a conference uh, tournament. So we definitely rely on her experience from that end. But, you know, it's a it's a challenge, I think, at the end of the year to be able to go to a place and play possibly just one game. Um, financially, it's a challenge. And I think people, you know, you know, that have experienced that know what that's like. But then again, um, you know, like many say when they are in the conference tournament mode, you get the opportunity before possibly NCAA regionals to be in an environment where it's, you know, lose, it's win or go home, you lose, you're done. So having that as a primer to the postseason can be good for the PAC 12, you know, hopefully the TV and the, the network can do it justice in terms of getting exposure and getting opportunity for our conference to get seen. And then I think the big goal for us as a conference is, you know, hey, when you host the Pac-12 tournament, these are the, the standards that you have to have to be able to host that tournament facility-wise to then be able to put more money and investment into the sport. Because um, I'm just going to say this because it's an opportunity and you have a bunch of viewers watching this, 
But, you know, as a sport, we don't have the opportunity at the end, like basketball and football do yet to have, you know, the kickback financially. So we might see softball is growing. Oh, and this assumed like TV monies that's coming back to us, but because of the NCAA and they, you know, the contract we have with CBS sports, we don't get a kickback from ESPN. We don't get kickbacks from networks yet. Um, and it might be seven or eight years before maybe that contract can be renegotiated. So I don't want anybody to get it twisted that we're, you know, getting all this money from the networks, um, which we wish we could. But, uh, you know, in the end, I think any exposure is great exposure. Any competition is great competition. And uh, it's definitely going to be something new for the Pac-12. And as you might mention next, uh, you know, the years to come won't have UCLA in it. So that's unfortunate for us as a, as a conference, you know, not having them in it. But um, the conference is really always always going to be strong, always going to be good, and it's going to continue to be the iron sharpens iron. We got to get you a hat and a great way to negotiate some of these deals for us on the sport there in the league. Ooh, yeah. You know, if you have right. a few minutes there, right? Oh, uh, well, let me bring up, you mentioned financially. One topic that's uh, real quick here, volleyball women's soccer this fall has experimented with seeding 32 teams to try to create more parity, less, pre you know, predictable matchups, geography motivated matchups, which you know very well as you're smiling, obviously about. There's financial, you know, they're, they're experimenting to see how it works from a financial standpoint and things like that. What's your reaction? To that? Do you think softball should look into that seating more, you know, 232 like volleyball women's soccer did? Yeah, I didn't pay too much attention to how it played out. I'd like, actually, I probably should go ask and get some feedback, but I think it's good. I think it's, you know, once you get past the 16 seeds that are, that are seated in like, you know, considered in that way, you get a lot of error. I mean, if I was involved in the committee, I'd be like, I don't really know. Everybody seems so good. I, how do you even like ranked, you know, teams? So I think it's something that should be considered. And, and um, I'd, I'd actually be interested to see how it, it plays out for sure. Yeah. I think everybody's waiting for the feedback after volleyball and women's soccer. And then I think baseball, softball may kind of look into that if depending on what the feedback is on that last question, before we let you go, you've been so kind. What is the keys for this year's Washington team? If we do blank, we will be able to accomplish blank. Oh, if we pitch, play defense, and hit, um, we're going to have a lot of success. I'm I'm hopeful for our group in in so many ways. You know, they came here uh, with the hopes of winning a national championship, and you know those those no matter what's happening around or how you compare this or that, that's on the external you can get all caught up in that. So let's not get caught up in that. Let's just uh, continue to see how good we can get with the humans that we have in our group. And um, again, like I'm super hopeful for our, for who we have in our group that um, in the end, we're going to be different than we were in the beginning. That's true. Well, we look forward to seeing your team uh, play this upcoming season coach. Uh, thanks always for taking the time from your busy schedule for talking to us. And because we are always at the top of the list of persons that I love talking about different topics in the sport internationally and in college, because uh, you have a great perspective in the game. Uh, thanks for everything you do for the sport. And uh, I'm happy that I don't see you at an airport for at least short term there. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us and we'll talk soon. Yeah, you got it, Eric. Thanks for what you do for softball. Thanks for supporting my gal bear over there and Kaya and Jen Salling and all those guys. There's a lot of them now. Yeah, that's a lot. I know. Jeez. Um, but yeah, we appreciate you and thanks for having me on.